What's up, Sanisa? Super Bad Estrada here, and I just want to give a huge special shout out to the relay. Thank you so much for all of the continuous support, and thank you for all of the support during and after and before every single fight. Welcome to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Two division champion Sanisa Estrada, on the heels of parting ways with Golden Boy Promotions, took to social media and stated, I won't be fighting August 6th in Texas, Aww. but you can still go and watch Marlon Esparza play patty cake with her opponent. With Sanisa Estrada leaving Golden Boy Promotions, she's no longer an option for Marlon Esparza or your cost of volume. We know that there was a report out some weeks ago that they planned to put Annabelle Ortiz in the ring with Sanisa Estrada for the second time. Why, I don't know. Sinesi Estrada beat Annabelle Ortiz for the WBA minimum weight title comprehensively. That was the report out a few weeks ago. A few weeks later, she's not going to be boxing on that card, and Marlena Esparza is going to be standing in her place against Eva Guzman. Now that Sinesi Estrada's out of the picture and she's not with Golden Boy Promotions anymore, we can speculate as to where she's going to pop up, though ultimately... Ultimately, neither Marlena Esparza or Yo Costa Valle, recent Golden Boy Promotions signee Yo Costa Valle, have seen Sinesia Estrada to look to as an option, a potential opponent option for the future, and it just so happens that Sinesia is a lot more popular than they are, a more fan-friendly fighter. And that's more important than you think, because that's probably the best money fight they could have had at or around these weights. Sinesia Estrada has put distance between herself and the stable of fighters over there at Golden Boy Promotions, and that changes things, it does. I half expected Marlon Esparza to box in another unification match in her very next fight as it stands she's gonna be boxing Eva Guzman instead instead of another champion at the weight Eva Guzman, who sports a professional record of 19 wins, one loss with one draw, 11 knockouts. A good number of these opponents are pedestrian-level opponents with upside-down records, more losses than victories, some fighters with no victories at all. In fact, in the 21 fights that Eva Guzman has fought in... 21 professional contests, only 4 out of 21 of Eva Guzman's opponents had winning records. Only 4 out of 21, that says a lot. I mean, she's got a winning record herself, don't get me wrong, it's 19-1, and one, but not all 19-1 and one records are the same as all other 19-1 and one records, if you catch my drift. And this is who Marlena Esparza is going to be fighting on the undercard of Virgil Ortiz versus McKinson early next month. Though it's not all doom and gloom, per se, there are two other champions that campaign at the same weight as Marlena Esparza, though comparatively... Fights with those fighters may not offer Marlena Esparza the same financial incentive as fighting Sinesia Estrada for a second time would. There's Leonela Paula Judica of Argentina who holds the IBF title, a long reigning champion that has reigned as that division's champion since December of 2014, the longest reigning champion at this weight, and the newly crowned Gabriela Celeste Alaniz, who very recently won the WBO title in June. I half expected Marlon Esparza to fight Yudica in her next fight because it's a safer choice than Alaniz. Don't misunderstand me, Leonela Paula Yudica is an unbeaten champion, a seasoned fighter, a seasoned veteran, and a long reigning one, but but it's a safer choice than fighting Gabriela Alaniz because Alaniz is a bigger puncher, a much bigger puncher than either Leonela Judica or Marlena Esparza. Marlena Esparza is a good boxer, decorated, don't get me wrong, but she's not big on power. She's not a puncher. Gabriela Alaniz is. Which makes me question as to whether or not Marlena Esparza will still shoot for undisputed in the flyweight division. Until further notice, in order to become an undisputed champion at this weight, Marlena's gonna have to take on the other two champions at this weight. And you could probably give her good odds against Leonela Paula Judica, but not good odds against Gabriela Alaniz. She's got the kind of punching power, pressure and ferocity that can cause an otherwise well-schooled, educated boxer to start to come apart at the seams. A boxer like Marlon Esparza. Argentinian fighters are notoriously tough and heavy-handed. That's what Gabriela Alaniz is. You say that taking on Gabriela Alaniz is a risky proposition, a risky fight. Even as far as unification matches go, it's a bit of a high-risk, low-reward. And there were risks associated with an Estrada rematch. Marlon might have lost the second fight the same way she lost the first, with difference being that fighting Sinesia for a second time likely would have yielded a bigger reward than taking on someone like Gabriela Alaniz. It's going to be very interesting to see who Marlon Esparza fights next beyond Eva Guzman. And we're going to give Eva a look to see just what exactly Marlon Esparza is up against. Get into a full fight breakdown as the fight date approaches. Keep your eyes peeled for the ring return of Marlon Esparza on the undercard of Ortiz versus McKinson. 
In men's light heavyweight news, an update to a story we talked about here on the channel. Bellazzi and John Pascal both accept IBF invitation to enter talks for an ordered title eliminator. There's a lot of movement in the men's light heavyweight division right now with John Pascal versus Joshua Bellazzi being ordered. Just by way of the IBF, by way of the WBC, Callum Smith will be taking on France's own Olympian, Matthew Bowderly. On the undercard of Joshua versus Usyk too. Just by way of the WBC, by way of the WBA, Dimitri Bivol must defend his title against Zerto Ramirez, and we'll see how long it takes to get that fight over the line. It comes to this fight, this eliminator by way of the IBF, an easier time came of proceeding with plans to determine the next IBF mandatory challenger than was the case at light heavyweight earlier this year. BoxingScene.com has confirmed that representatives for Joshua Buazzi and John Pascal have both responded to an accepted invitation from the IBF to enter talks for a sanctioned final eliminator. Both parties were required to respond by Monday 5 p.m. with their intentions to proceed with the fight, which will be followed by the next step of the IBF assigning a free negotiation period to work out terms. The winner of the eventual eliminator will become the IBF mandatory challenger to lineal and unified like heavyweight champion Artur Betterbeef, who's going to be in action later on this year against another one of his mandatory challengers, Anthony Yarn. This is what I mean when I said there's a lot of movement in the light heavyweight division right now. The winner of this fight will become one of two mandatory challengers waiting in the queue for the winner of Artur Betterbeef versus Anthony Yard. The two sides have until August 11th to reach a deal and avoid a purse bid hearing. Should the bout go to a purse bid, Buazzi would be entitled to 60% of the winning bid as the higher ranked fighter, currently number three. Per IBF rule 9D, the remaining 40% would go to Pascal as the number six ranked contender. In between the two are a pair of contenders with other plans. This is going to create a very interesting situation. Interesting indeed, because most people favor Artur Betterbeef to plow through Anthony Yard, though even if he does, he still has other mandatory challengers to satisfy, and short of an undisputed title fight with the winner of Bivol versus Ramirez, he's going to have to satisfy them. That's the only way to get an exemption to the mandatory. Mandatories. Interestingly, Boatsy was being groomed for a shot at Dimitri Bivol before the WBA stepped in to order its mandatory title fight. Both are promoted by Matchroom Boxing, with group chairman Eddie Hearn previously declaring his intentions to stage such a fight later on this fall. However, such talks were trumped by the sanctioning body's ruling, at which point it was too late to file an exemption for Bivol to first make a voluntary voluntary title defense. We know that's what Eddie wanted. Eddie wanted to do a Buatzi versus Bivol fight. Based on this order, they're doing a Buatzi versus Pascal fight instead. The development led to representatives for Buatzi, a bronze medalist for the 2016 Great Britain Olympic boxing team that competed in Rio, to move forward with a very makeable fight with Quebec's Jean Pascal, a former lineal WBC light heavyweight champion. Pascal was on board from the moment the fight was offered. Greg Leone, Pascal's longtime manager, immediately contacted the IBF to confirm their side's intention to take the fight that would place the Haiti-born Quebec-based former champion back in title contention. Both are coming off wins just one day apart this past May. I wondered if the Buatsi people would go through with this or would they decide to go in another direction. If you pay attention to Eddie Hearn's track record, he's not one for spoon feeding his fighters lighter touches, soft touches. I mean, consider that the Josh Kelly versus David Avenesian fight. That wasn't a fight that Josh Kelly needed right then and right there, but the fight got made anyway, and we all saw what happened. We all saw that Josh, he wasn't ready for a guy like David. There are similarities here between Joshua Buatzi and this John Pascal fight because John Pascal, like David Avenesian, is a lot more experienced than the fighter that he's facing. Uh, Joshua Buatzi, like Josh Kelly, is an Olympic amateur standout. There were similarities there. The 39-year-old Pascal returned to title stage following a 12-round unanimous decision win over previously unbeaten Meng Feng Long on May 20th in Plant City, Florida. Feng Long entered the fight as the number one contender and with hopes of challenging Artur Betterbeef, who at the time was four weeks up from his eventual second round knockout of Joe Smith Jr. in their June 18th lineal WBC, IBF, WBO unification bout 
about New York City. Pascal ruined those plans, dropping Fang Long in the ninth round of their Pro Box TV main event en route to a competitive but unanimous decision in his first fight following a 28-month layoff. Pascal hadn't fought since a 12-round split decision win over Badu Jack in December of 2019, four months after claiming a secondary WBA light heavyweight title in a technical decision over then unbeaten Marcus Brown. This is the most experienced and seasoned fighter that Joshua Boazzi will have faced. A former champion. And I think he's at a stage where those are the kind of fighters that he's supposed to be fighting. I thought it too much of a broad leap to put Joshua Buatzi in there with Dimitri Bivol so soon after the Craig Richards fight. Nothing against Craig Richards, but... And nothing against Joshua Buatzi either, but that was a domestic level scrap at best, not world level. Ricard Balat next to Craig Richards to Dimitri Bivol seems a broad leap to me. It seems that there's supposed to be one or two extra steps there en route to fighting a reigning champion at this weight. And this fight with John Pascal makes a little bit more sense to me, even if it is, in many ways, a sink or swim situation. A sink or swim situation for Joshua Buatzi, who's really not a prolific puncher. He doesn't throw punches in bunches, but John Pascal, he does. This fight won't have the lulls in action and quiet moments that the Craig Richards fight did. John Pascal is the kind of mid-range to inside swarmer that forces a guy to fight, forces him out, forces him to throw. Joshua Buatzi being the far less experienced fighter, he needs to be tested. This would be a common opponent between Joshua Buatzi and Dimitri Bivol, the second to be exact. They both decisioned Craig Richards and Dimitri Bivol some years ago, he outpointed John Pascal. It would go a long way towards establishing Joshua Buatzi as a world level contender if he too can make it past today's John Pascal, who's 39 years old. Oh yeah, he's getting long in the tooth, but he's still out here beating unbeaten fighters. He gave Marcus Brown his first professional loss and more Recently, he gave Meng Fang Long his first professional loss. Jean Pascal, he may never win another alphabet title at this weight for the rest of his career, but he's still got enough to give these young unbeaten guys a run for their money. And I like this fight. The boxer versus the puncher. Joshua Buatzi being the boxer, Jean Pascal being the puncher, the prolific puncher, the busy puncher. Like I said, you won't see those lulls in action in those quiet moments that you saw in the Craig Richards fight in this fight because Jean Pascal is going to force Joshua Buatzi to throw. Force him to fight. It's going to be interesting to see how Joshua Boazzi handles that, how he deals with that pressure from the seasoned veteran and the former champion. Winner of the fight becomes the mandatory challenger for the winner of Artur Betterbeev versus Anthony Yard. Which creates yet another interesting situation and yet another interesting potential matchup at light heavyweight, which is fast heating up. It's not a foregone conclusion that Joshua Buatzi wins that fight, though. It's not really a foregone conclusion that a 39-year-old John Pascal wins it either. The winner of the fight becomes the mandatory challenger for Artur Betterbeef. Artur, who posted this caption to his social media, which reads, A week after the surgery, leg no longer hurts. I walk pretty freely. But to be in a situation where you can't train is quite strange. Ever since I joined boxing, daily exercise has become a part of my life. Without them, it is difficult to imagine not only my life, but also myself. But I found a way out. Since I can't train, I actively rest. What do you do when you can't train? What do you do? Insights into what our Tour Better Beef's been up to since unifying titles with Joe Smith Jr. This goes back to what I've said in previous videos, that even in fights where the fighter wins, even in fights where the fighter emerges the victor, there is wear and tear that takes place. There is a portion of the fight that stays with the fighter. Artur Betterbeev beat Joe Smith Jr. quite handily, but Artur Betterbeev is an aging fighter, an aging champion. He doesn't look it, but he's pushing 40. He made it look easy against Joe Smith Jr. I thought it would last a little longer than it did. I don't even recall Joe Smith Jr. landing a single meaningful punch, a single eye-catching shot. Yet in spite of this, Artur Betterbeev did have a nagging injury, something that was hampering him post-fight, and he had to have surgery. He's had that surgery, seems to be in good spirits, and he's walking freely, but it goes back to what I told you. He's an aging fighter, an aging champion. This isn't the first time we've heard of Artur Betterbeev suffering some kind of an injury over time. A little over a year ago, I remember hearing that he suffered broken ribs 
ribs and sparring. More recently, he suffered some kind of a leg injury. This is a big part of the reason I've favored Dimitri Bivol to beat him if and when those two fighters, those two champions meet. Time is on Dimitri Bivol's side. And we're a ways up from an undisputed light heavyweight title fight. Dimitri's fighting Zerto Ramirez, Artur, he's going to fight Anthony Yard at the end of this year. This adds an interesting element to that Anthony Yard fight because while most people are favoring Artur Betterbeef to plow through that guy. Could this injury play a factor? Could Anthony Yard stand a better chance of winning since Artur's coming off an injury? Artur's coming off an injury in a fight that he won easy. So what happens if he has to work for his money? What happens if he has to work a little harder with Anthony Yard, even if he wins? Who says he doesn't suffer another nagging injury? Another injury that could hamper his performance moving forward. As stated, I favor Dimitri if it comes down to Dimitri and Artur until further notice because time is on Dimitri's side. It's not on Artur's. Artur better be unified lineal and ring magazine light heavyweight champion who will have two mandatory challengers in the queue after he satisfies this one. After he satisfies Anthony Yard, he's got to fight the winner of Buatzi versus Pascal by way of the IBF. And the winner of recently announced Callum Smith versus Matthew Bowder Lee. Set to go down on the undercard of Joshua versus Yusuk too. I wonder if it's written in the contract somewhere between Callum Smith and Matchroom that he has to make all his appearances on the undercards of Anthony Joshua's fights because he's a bit of a bad luck charm. He fought on the undercard of Joshua versus Ruiz won, and he fought on the undercard more recently of Joshua versus Yusuk. Here he is set to fight again. He's back on the undercard for the rematch against France's own Olympian Matthew Bowder League. Not a bad looking undercard if I do say so myself. Callum Smith versus Bowder League, Badu Jack versus Richard Rivera, an IBF final eliminator at heavyweight between Philippe Hergovic and Zile Zhang. Ramla Ali is going to be making history in Jeddah at the Superdome. Making history for women athletes, women boxers. I always wondered if they allow a woman to box on a card. But here we are. Ramla Ali is going to be making an appearance on that same card. That undercard alongside Callum Smith and Matthew Bowderleek in what is a WBC final eliminator to crown yet another mandatory challenger for our tour better be. This puts Matchroom, could put Matchroom in a unique situation to where they can attempt to get our tour on the zone side of things two separate times for two separate fights. Though what will the condition of our tour better be? B. I mean, think about it. If he doesn't unify titles with Dimitri Bivol to get an exemption to all these mandatories waiting for him, he's going to have to satisfy each one individually. I like Callum Smith's chances against French Olympian Matthew Bowderleek, who has been stopped before. This will be only the second time we've seen Callum Smith in action since he enlisted the aid of Buddy McGirt. And he left a lasting impression with that highlight reel knockout he racked up over Lennon Castillo. It's almost unfortunate that he's been so sparsely active. He last saw action in September of last year, whereas Matthew... Yeah, it's the same deal with Matthew. He hasn't fought since September of last year either. His last in action against Russia's own Igor Mikalkin, whereas Callum, he was last in action against Lennon Castillo, who I just mentioned. Callum Smith, the former champion, the orthodox fighter, whereas Matthew, Matthew, he's a southpaw. And we're gonna have to give Matthew Bowderleek a closer look as the fight date approaches. But so far, so good. I like what's going on at light heavyweight. I like this undercard. And I like this fight.